Up until now, we have considered only those regressions which are linear in variables, that is, in which both the independent and dependent variables are linear. However, there is no reason to believe that economic relationships will be linear. For example, if we consider the relationship between interest rate and GDP, then at some point we will run into the problem of liquidity trap. Hence, the assumption of a linear relationship between interest rate and GDP does not hold. But before that, what we have been considering till now is a linear in variables model. That is a model of the form y i is equal to alpha plus beta x i plus sigma i. We can of course take more independent variables by adding x i's, but the point still remains that beta represents a linear relationship. That is, for every one unit change in x i, y i changes by beta units, keeping all other independent variables constant. That is, ceteris paribus. So graphically, when we represent this on the xy plane, we see that if beta is less than zero, then there is a straight line which is downward sloping, and if beta is greater than zero, then there is a straight line which is upward sloping. So the relationship between these two variables is represented by a straight line. One of the most interesting functional forms that we have to study is the double log or the log linear model. So in this case, we have the raw data, which is a bundle of x's and y's. We take the logs of both of them and then we run a regression such as log of y i is equal to alpha plus beta of log of x i plus sigma i. A typical price quantity relationship would be of this form. For example, log of q is equal to alpha plus beta log of p plus sigma. One of the most interesting properties of this functional form is obtained once we run a total differentiation of both the sides. So by taking the rate of change on both of sides of this equation, we observe that the elasticity, which is del y by y by del x by x, that is the rate of change of y with respect to the rate of change of x is constant, that is it equals beta. So this is the reason why this is also called a constant elasticity model. The slope as you can see is beta into y by x. Hence the slope is dependent on the particular value of y and x on that point. Hence, it is not constant for the entire functional form. The interpretation of the slope coefficient, as we previously said, is the percentage change in y caused by a percentage change in x holding all other variables constant. Since this is seen to be constant in this functional form, hence the elasticity of y with respect to x is constant. For example, to put numbers into it, if beta is taken to be 2, then a 2% change in x causes a 2% change in y. When we look at it in the xy plane, we see that if beta is less than 0, then what we are primarily looking at is a downward sloping parabola. And if beta is greater than 0, then we have an upward sloping curve which eventually flattens out. Another important functional form is the log lin or the growth model form. In this case, we take the log of the dependent variable that is log of y i and we run a regression with the linear form of x i. So a typical log lin model would be like log y i is equal to alpha plus beta x i plus sigma i. One demographic relationship that will typically follow this functional form is between population and time. Since we expect that population would grow at a constant percentage per year, Hence, if we take the log of population and run a regression on time, then we will obtain a function as in log of population is equal to alpha plus beta t plus sigma. That is, the log of population grows at a constant rate with respect to t, which also means that population grows at an exponential rate with respect to t. That is, every year population is growing by beta percent. So, when we take the total differentiation of this functional form, what we obtain here is that elasticity and slope are both variable and not constant along the regression line. So when we look at it graphically, we obtain something like this. So when x represents time and y represents population, then we take a point, the reference point, which is time equal to zero. So if we take 1990, for example, as the reference time, then 1990 would represent x equal to zero. At x equal to 0, y has a particular value which is represented by y0. As time increases, y starts increasing at an exponential rate. That is, the value of y keeps increasing at an increasing rate. 
So the interpretation of slope coefficient in this case is the relative change in y caused due to a unit change in x, ceteris paribus. That is if x changes by one unit, so if we increase time by one year, what is the relative or percentage change in y? Hence, say if beta equal to 0 0.02, then a one unit change in x causes a 2% change in y. What you can see in the graph is that neither the slope nor the elasticity of y with respect to x is constant. So the slope of y with respect to x is given by beta into y and that is it's an increasing function of y whereas the elasticity of y with respect to x is given by beta into x that is it is an increasing function of x. The next functional form that we consider is the lin log model that is when the y's are in the linear form but the x's are in the log forms. Apart from the theoretical reasons behind using a log for one of the independent variables this can also be justified when the yi is extremely sensitive to changes in xi. Once we take the total differentiation on both sides of the functional form, we observe again that elasticity and slope are not constant throughout the regression line. However, what we see is that instead of being directly proportional to either x or y, in this case they are inversely proportional to x and to y. So to put some more examples into it, uh, we can take a case wherein alpha equal to 0 and beta is greater than 0. In this case, x and y have a positive relationship and the curve flattens out as x increases. In this case, the interpretation of the slope coefficient would be the absolute change in y caused due to a relative change in x, ceteris paribus. To so consider a previous example between GDP and interest rate, in that case, if a beta had come out to be 0.05, then we can say that a 5% change in x causes a 1 unit change in y that is a 5% change in interest rate would cause a 1 unit change in the GDP. As we have previously shown by taking total differentiation on both sides, the slope of y with respect to x is given by beta into 1 by x and the elasticity of y with respect to x is given by beta into 1 by y. The next set of models that we discuss are reciprocal models. In this case, instead of taking yi as a function of xi, we take yi as a function of 1 by xi. So in which case beta would represent the change in yi caused due to a unit change in the reciprocal of xi, ceteris paribus. As is obvious, it doesn't really hold any kind of significance. Except for telling us that there is an inverse relationship between y and x, beta doesn't really aid us in further analysis. What is more important in this set of models is the asymptotic property. That is, as xi tends to infinity, what happens to yi? So a couple of thumb rules is that as xi tends to infinity, yi tends to alpha, which is obvious because 1 by xi will tend to 0 and hence yi will equal to alpha. As xi tends to 0, yi can either tend to infinity beta is positive or minus infinity beta is negative. Usually when we talk about reciprocal models, there is an underlying assumption that xi will be positive. However, that is not really important for whatever analysis that we do. But maintaining that assumption that xi is positive, we basically bother about four different types of graphs. So let us first consider these two graphs, in which case the common property is that alpha is greater than zero. Hence as xi tends to infinity, yi tends to stabilize around a positive value given by alpha. However, in the case when beta is positive, in that case we see that the line starts from y equal to infinity and then comes down to alpha, whereas in the case when beta is negative, the curve starts from minus infinity and then comes all the way up to alpha. Similarly, if we take a negative alpha, we obtain similar properties that is when beta is greater than zero, then there is a downward sloping curve coming down to alpha which is negative and if beta is negative then we have an upward sloping curve which comes all the way up to alpha. The next class of models that we consider are called polynomial models. In this case y which is the dependent variable is regressed on a number of independent variables which are higher powers of the same variable. For example if we consider x as an independent variable then in the right hand side of the regression we take x and we take higher powers of x such as x square, x cube, x to the power 4 and so on. So a typical polynomial model would look like yi is equal to alpha plus beta 1 xi 
प्लस बीटा टू एक्स आई स्क्वायर प्लस बीटा थ्री एक्स आई क्यूब प्लस सिग्मा आई पोलिनोमल फंक्शन विल बी यूज वेन द रिलेशनशिप बिटवीन टू वेरिएबल्स इज नॉट यूनिफॉर्म सो फॉर एग्जाम्पल इफ यू टेक द रिलेशनशिप बिटवीन टोटल फिक्स कॉस्ट एंड क्वान्टिटी प्रोड्यूस then at some point the total fixed cost increases at an increasing rate with quantity whereas at some points it increases at a decreasing rate that is it can either be convex or concave with different values of q hence take this example when on the xy plane we have plotted the total fixed cost and quantity initially the relationship between total fixed cost and quantity is concave that is it is increasing at a decreasing rate beyond a certain point the relationship turns into a convex relationship that is it is increasing at an increasing rate this can be represented by a polynomial model given suitable conditions on beta 1 beta 2 and beta 3 which we do not deal with here one obvious problem with such a model is the problem of multicollinearity if you are considering x1 and higher powers of x1 that is x1 square x1 cube then one can suspect that there will be high degree of collinearity between these independent variables For example, if you take number of samples is equal to ten, then we see that the correlation coefficient between x one and x one square is point nine seven five, whereas the correlation coefficient between x one and x one cube is equal to point nine two eight. As the number of samples n increases, the correlation coefficient reduces. However, it still remains significantly high. Hence, the natural question arises. that since we see such a high degree of multicollinearity are the gauss markov assumptions violated you would remember that they aren't multicollinearity is a problem only if there is perfect multicollinearity that is when the correlation coefficient between two of the independent variables is equal to 1 in this case we see that even the collinearity is very high it is not equal to 1 hence the gauss markov assumptions are not violated hence whatever estimates of beta 1 beta 2 and beta 3 we obtain will still be blue that is best linear unbiased estimators so now we look at more properties of such polynomial function the interpretation of slope coefficients is slightly tricky in this case for example it is not possible to interpret beta 1 beta 2 beta 3 and so on separately due to high multicollinearity that is if we try to interpret beta 1 as the change in y i caused due to a unit change in x i we also have to note that a unit change in x i is accompanied by some change in x i square and some change in x i cube hence the interpretation of beta 1 which crucially depends on the assumption of ceteris paribus that is all other variables will be constant cannot hold hence partial slope coefficients in this case are meaningless also note that since we saw a very high degree of multicollinearity hence we suffer from the basic problems of multicollinearity that is the t values of beta 1 beta 2 etc are likely to be low and hence they are not very likely to be significant also note that if we try to convert a polynomial model by taking logs on both sides that is a double log model then instead of getting imperfect but high multicollinearity we get perfect multicollinearity in which case we cannot obtain independent estimates of beta 1 beta 2 and so on the next class of functional form that we will study are regression through origin models in this case the regression line which is still linear is pivoted around the origin while in the linear in variables model that we studied previously the rss was minimized by changing two parameters alpha and beta in this case alpha is fixed at 0 and we conditionally minimize rss by changing beta hence the rss is not minimized with respect to what it would have been had we inserted a parameter alpha hence since the rss is not minimized this has to be used only when there are very strong theoretical reasons to use a regression through the origin for example one such theoretical reason could be the phillips curve the phillips curve which says that the change in inflation from last year is equal to minus beta times the difference between the unemployment in this period and the natural rate of unemployment in such a theoretical model there is no place for an intercept term and hence we run a regression through the origin r square in this case is also meaningless since the conventional derivation of an r square assumes the existence of an intercept term this will be a problem as we will see in the next slide 
When we are calculating the coefficients in a regression through the origin model, there are several changes that we must make to the way we calculate our coefficients. So let b be the OLS estimator of beta, wherein beta is the coefficient in a model such as y i is equal to beta x i plus sigma i. Instead of having b equal to summation of small x i small y i by small x i square, that is the cross product of deviations from the mean divided by the square of the deviations from the mean, we take b is equal to capital x i capital y i by sigma x i square. So note that instead of taking deviations, we are taking the absolute values. Similarly, sigma square b is equal to the mean square error by sigma x i square where mean square error is equal to summation of y i minus expectation of y by n minus 1. There are two things about this formula that you must observe. First is that we are dividing the mean square error by sigma x i square. Again, this is capital X which represents the absolute value, whereas in bivariate regression which we have run till now, we take small x i square wherein it was the deviation from the mean. Another thing to be noted is that while calculating the mean square error, we are now dividing by n minus 1. This is fairly obvious because now we have only one parameter that we are calculating and hence we lose only one degree of freedom. As we talked about previously, the r square in this case is also defined, but it is defined as b square into summation x i square by summation y i square. However, this r square can be absurdly large even for meaningless regressions and hence it is not usually quoted in the output of any standard statistical software. The last set of models that we consider is standardized models. So once we are given our values, we take all the y's calculate the mean of y and the standard deviation of y. Then we standardize y by using the formula y i minus expectation of y divided by standard error of y. In this case the y i's are turned into a more or less normal distribution and hence this is the reason why it is called a standardized model. We use a similar procedure for x1's and x2's and hence get a new set of variables which are the standardized variables such as y i star, x1 i star and x2 i star. Note that for each of these variables what we are essentially doing is to subtract a constant which is given by the expectation of that variable and then divide by the standard error of that variable which is like dividing by any constant. Since given a sample the expectation and the standard error are constant hence what we are doing is to shift the origin and then engage in rescaling. Hence what we observe is that subtracting a constant does not change the absolute value of the coefficient whereas dividing by a constant will change the absolute value and standard error by the same fraction and hence does not change the overall significance. What that means is that if beta in a linear and variables model was significant earlier it will still continue to be significant now. However, the absolute value of beta will change. But this change will also be matched by a change in the standard deviation of beta of an equal magnitude. We would use standardized models when, for example, we want to study the effect of a one unit standard deviation change in x on y. This brings to an end our discussion of functional forms. Note two things which are important in the case of functional forms. The first is to know when to use which particular functional form. Hence if we are interested in finding out the elasticity between two variables then we should use a double log model. The second important thing is to know what is the interpretation of the slope coefficients. Hence if we are talking about a lin log model then we should know that the slope coefficient represents a percentage change in x is causing a unit change in y. That is all that we have to say about functional forms.